we're just going to give everybody a couple seconds to log in. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on managing greenhouse light emissions and growing under light abatement curtains. My name is Amy Kuniakis, and I'm the editor uh, for Greenhouse Canada magazine. I'm joined today by Fatty, Fatty El Dowd from Greenhouse, who is the Greenhouse Vegetable Specialist for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. During our session today, Fadi will share insights from several research projects on the effect of light abatement curtains on the greenhouse environment and plant physiology. In this discussion, we hope to dive into the fundamentals of curtains and how lighting strategies can be used to achieve an optimal greenhouse environment. The session is expected to take approximately an hour with Fadi presenting for about three quarters of that. Uh, the rest of the time will be open for questions and discussion. Before I think, hand things over to Fadi, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, as always, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to registrants uh, approximately 24 hours after the live broadcast. Uh, questions for our speaker are welcomed at the end of the presentation and can be submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you run any if you run into any technical difficulties, uh, please let me know through the Q&A uh, and I will try and help you. Myself or my colleague will try and help you. Uh, with that, I'd now like to turn things over to this afternoon's speaker. As I mentioned, Fadi is the Greenhouse Vegetable spe Specialist for OMAFRA with more than 20 years experience conducting applied and fundamental research on horticultural and field crops in support of the controlled environment agriculture sector in Ontario and beyond. Without further ado, I'll let you take it away, Fadi. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Amy. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my presentation and, and hear me uh, clearly. So first I'd like to thank Greenhouse uh, Canada Magazine for uh, inviting me to uh, give this uh, webinar as Amy mentioned, um, I'll be talking about some of the projects that we have uh, looking at managing greenhouse uh, light emissions. And as you can see from this uh, title slide here, it's a fairly large uh, collaboration. We have uh, the University uh, of Guelph, uh, uh, Professor William uh, Lubitz, uh, as well as uh, Thomas Graham. Um, they're from the University of Guelph and the School of Engineering is the uh, Lubitz Lab and the School of Environmental Sciences uh, for the Graham Lab. Uh, we also uh, have in collab collaboration with uh, Agriculture Ag Food Canada at the Harrow Research and Development Center, where Quay Digweed is the engineer and uh, Dr. Shuming Hao is the uh, plant physiologist and uh, myself for after I put myself last year because uh, really the researchers are the ones that did um, all the work that I'll be presenting. So this um, presentation is gonna be divided up into uh, a number of uh, sections. Um, I'll start with an introduction both to my uh, myself, uh, as well as the uh, topic that I'll be talking about. Um, I'll follow that up with uh, two separate sections looking at some of the research projects. First, I'll talk about greenhouse uh, light emissions uh, data that we have uh, from a few um, uh, seasons. Uh, with some of the drone studies that we did. And then I'll uh, go into uh, some of the more recent uh, data looking at the effect of light abatement curtains on the uh, greenhouse growing environment, uh, as well as the uh, crops uh, under uh, light abatement curtains. Uh, and I'll finish the presentation with just some conclusions and uh, some recommendations. So for those uh, who don't know, uh, OMAFRA, has a whole greenhouse uh, team. Uh, you can see here uh, the four of us, uh, the two of us work with uh, greenhouse uh, vegetables. Uh, so myself uh, and uh, Kara McCreary, and the other two, uh, Abigail uh, Wiesner and Dr. Sarah Jendrasik, they work with uh, greenhouse uh, flowers or for the greenhouse uh, floriculture uh, sector. So myself 
and Abby, we're more on the production side. So we deal with things like uh, environment control, uh, lighting, irrigation, those sorts of things. Uh, whereas uh, Kara and Sarah, they're more on the pest management side of things. So any kind of disease issues or, or pest questions you may have, uh, that's um, uh, they're the experts in those topics. Uh, we also have uh, separate uh, blogs that you can uh, subscribe to. We have the on greenhousevegetables.ca blog uh, that uh, myself and, and Kara uh, contribute to and and uh, and we edit. Um, and the onfloriculture.com blog is uh, Abby's and uh, and Sarah's blog, uh, where you can get more information on uh, some of the uh, information and uh, events that uh, that we hold. Uh, Karen and I are based out of the Agriculture Agri-Food Canada's uh, Harrow Research and Development Centre in Harrow, Ontario. So this is very close to the concentration of greenhouses in the Leamington uh, Kingsville area. Uh, in southwestern Ontario. Uh, my portfolio includes really uh, any food that's produced in a controlled environment, as well as cannabis. So, you know, vegetables, berries, leafy greens, uh, anything like that in greenhouses, uh, as well as vertical farms. Um, I work very closely with producers, uh, researchers, and industry uh, to advance uh, controlled environment agriculture uh, in the province. Uh, I do a lot of on-farm research, uh, as well as uh, hold a lot of education and uh, training uh, events, and we call those knowledge transfer and uh, translation, or, or KTT. Some of the ways that uh, we um, disseminate some of the information uh, to growers, to industry, uh, are through some of the resources that I have listed here. Uh, so I mentioned the blog. We have a Grow On educational series. Uh, and if you subscribe to the blog, you'll be up to date in terms of uh, all of our activities, our, our regular uh, grow on uh, events, uh, some in person, uh, some online, uh, some in a hybrid uh, format. Uh, and we try to uh, do that to um, you know reach as many people as, uh, as we can. Uh, we're also uh, organizers, uh, co-organizers of the Canadian Greenhouse Conference. Um, it's an annual uh, conference in the beginning of October in Niagara Falls uh, on the Canadian side of the border uh, in Niagara Falls, Ontario. Uh, and it's a great conference. We have a, a trade show floor. Uh, we take up basically almost the whole Scotiabank Convention Center there uh, every year. We have a trade show floor where you can visit booths from ag tech companies and suppliers and seed companies, uh, lighting companies, all, all that sort of, uh, uh, sort of thing with lots of information. But we also have a speaker program. So there are concurrent uh, rooms there um, that are running um, you know, different uh, sessions on different topics, including production topics like lighting and, and energy, uh, as well as pests and, and disease uh, uh, sessions as well. So check out the website and you can get a lot of information uh, on there as well about uh, attending that as well. Uh, and of course, we collaborate with uh, Greenhouse Canada like we're doing right now. We uh, co-author a number of articles uh, in the magazine, and uh, I definitely um, would uh, suggest that everybody uh, subscribe to that as well. The uh, greenhouse sector in Ontario has been uh, growing signific significantly over the years. Uh, you can see here from this pie chart uh, representing the share of horticultural cash receipts uh, for, uh, for the province. So this is both a field as well as greenhouse. Uh, you can see in, in 2001, uh, greenhouse vegetables accounted for uh, almost 19% of the total horticultural uh, cash receipts in the province. By uh, 2021, uh, that share almost doubled uh, to uh, almost 35% uh, of the total uh, horticultural cash receipts. So that's you know, uh, more than a third of, uh, of the province's uh, cash receipts. So this uh, significant uh, increase in growth of the greenhouse sector in the province that's uh, happening, that happened over the past decades and continuing uh, today is mainly happened in two main regions. So primarily in Southwestern Ontario, in the Essex uh, region uh, near the Detroit border, uh, and in the Niagara region near the Buffalo border. So you can see here, this is Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Uh, and these are the two main areas. Of course, there are some uh, areas in between there uh, where there's 
uh, some um, uh, significant greenhouse uh, production, but uh, really Essex, Windsor Essex is the main one, uh, followed by the uh, Niagara region uh, in the province. And as the greenhouse sector has uh, increased over uh, the past uh, you know, few years, um, so has the use of supplemental lighting. Uh, and, and, the, and for Southwestern Ontario, uh, the use of supplemental lighting is very important specifically for producing in uh, the winter time. So if you're looking at winter production of vegetables or, or fruit uh, or uh, cannabis, uh, really the use of supplemental lighting uh, is necessary for increasing the daily light integral uh, to maximize that uh, crop production. Uh, and, and with that use of supplemental lighting, um, there was an increase in the uh, unintended uh, consequences like you know, light emissions uh, from the greenhouses. Um, so in order to reduce and control some of the uh, light emissions from greenhouses, there are a number of mun municipalities uh, in the province that have enacted uh, some bylaws to uh, try to restrict the amount of uh, light coming from uh, greenhouses. Uh, and in order to comply with some of these um, bylaws, in order to be uh, good neighbors, um, many, uh, most of the greenhouse uh, growers that I work with are using uh, light abatement curtains uh, with, sub, with, you know, in, in accompaniment to uh, supplemental lighting uh, in order to reduce reduce those uh, light emissions. Um, and, and as you can imagine, these light abatement curtains are almost like a blanket when you put them, uh, when you deploy them, but almost like a blanket that you put on top of a greenhouse. They trap in a lot of heat and, and moisture. Uh, so often uh, gapping is, is employed uh, in order to be able to um, vent uh, some of the heat, uh, vent some of that uh, excess uh, humidity and try to optimize the uh, growing conditions in the greenhouse uh, under these light abatement curtains. Uh, and, and in order uh, for us to understand uh, better uh, the effect of light abatement curtains uh, on light emissions, as well as the greenhouse and the crops that are grown in it, uh, there was a study uh, that was launched. And this study that I'm talking about was launched in uh, 2020. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a fairly big uh, collaboration, uh, and over the years, we've published uh, a number of peer-reviewed um, research articles, uh, but as well as two uh, fact sheets or, or articles uh, that uh, summarize some of the findings. And we published those articles both uh, on the blog that we have, uh, but also through Greenhouse Canada. So if you look at the December uh, 2022 issue of Greenhouse Canada magazine, uh, you can find uh, the, the initial uh, article, uh, and then we follow that up with a second article in December of 2023. Uh, and and uh, most of the information that I'm going to be presenting here uh, is found in those articles as well. So you can use that as a, as a, re as a reference. And we're hoping to uh, move forward uh, with some of the um, uh, with some of the uh, uh, information and and produce. Uh, something um, in, in the next little while, uh, you know, a best management practice type of uh, document. Okay, so before I get into some of the data, uh, I want to talk about you know what are uh, greenhouse uh, light abatement curtains, and uh, uh, you know that this table here shows you some examples of light abatement curtain models, uh, their manufacturer specifications. Uh, this is not really a, supposed to be a comprehensive list. It just kind of gives you some examples. Uh, you can see the, the, the main ones are the ceiling and, and wall curtains. Uh, and these are not to be confused with blackout curtains. You know, we have blackout curtains, we have light abatement curtains. And I do like to make a distinction between the two because uh, blackout curtains are usually black on the inside and they're used to control the photo period, right? They, they try to keep light outside of the greenhouse. Uh, in order to control uh, the flowering time of flowers and, and cannabis and those sorts of crops. But for vegetables, really, we're looking at light abatement curtains like these ones in this picture here that, that are white on the inside, trying to keep light inside the greenhouse uh, rather than keeping it out uh, of the greenhouse. Uh, so when I say light abatement curtains, these are the ones that I'm talking about. And uh, the two main ones are the ones that you put on the ceiling uh, as, uh, as well as the ones that you put on the end walls. And, and those are two separate types. You can see here, they can be made from different materials. Some are polyester, some are uh, polyethylene, 
Uh, it just depends on the model and specification, some are a mixture of uh, different compounds. Uh, the weight is an important consideration because you can see the, the ceiling curtains are a lot lighter than the wall curtains to reduce the stress on the greenhouse environment when you're uh, deploying and then closing the curtains. Um, um, and uh, the, the fire retardant characteristic of these light abatement curtains is something important to pay attention to because we want to make sure that they are uh, fire retardant and uh, there's no uh, risk of uh, spreading any kind of uh, fire. Uh, with uh, with this material. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers will list the light transmission uh, capabilities and, and characteristics of the light abatement curtains, as well as the energy saving. So you can see here, you know, they range in terms of the light transmission uh, all the way from 0 0.01 uh, up to 2% of the light, you know, going through the light abatement curtain, depending on the model. Uh, and the energy savings hover around 50%, but they range anywhere between yeah, 45 to 70 percent uh, energy savings because the energy currents, as I mentioned, try uh, you know keep the the heat in, so you're not necessarily heating as much, uh, especially in the in the winter time. Uh, so those are you know some things you can find uh, on the um, the supplier websites and and, and uh, talk to your uh, representatives and your growing consultants and and there's lots of information out there about uh, the different curtains and different models. When these curtains are uh, not used, or even when they're uh, gapped, uh, there's quite a bit of light that comes out of the uh, greenhouses, and this could cause uh, light pollution through the scattering of light uh, into the atmosphere that can create a, a, a sky glow effect, right? When we're looking up and, and we see the reflection uh, of the light coming off of not greenhouses, but any kind of man-made uh, artificial light uh, that's used uh, at night. Um, this uh, light pollution uh, could have possible negative uh, effects on the ecology, uh, astronomical viewing, as well as uh, human impacts, right? For it could affect uh, sleep uh, habits if uh, people uh, are affected by uh, the outdoor light and they don't keep that out, uh, out of their, their homes. Um, and, uh, and could also, uh, this particular phenomenon, the light pollution and the sky glow, is fairly uh, um, uh, affected by the climatic uh, conditions. So, you know, things like the cloud cover could affect the perception of the sky glow. Things like the phase of the moon, whether it's a full moon or a new moon, could affect how we perceive that light pollution. So, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, topic. Uh, and sky brightness uh, is a combination of, uh, as I mentioned, light pollution as well as natural. So, as I mentioned, the, the full uh, moon uh, effect or, or or the new moon, if there's no moon there, uh, could affect our perception of uh, of that light. So some of the questions that we try to answer in the first few seasons uh, of the study in the winter of 2020 and 2021, and in the winter of 2021 and 2022, um, uh, these particular studies were conducted mainly by the University of Guelph. Uh, and some of the questions that the researchers uh, were trying to answer included uh, how much does greenhouse lighting affect uh, the light emissions and sky brightness? Uh, how do light emissions and sky brightness change when light abatement curtains are open versus when they are uh, gapped uh, or fully deployed or fully closed? And uh, how much do light abatement, uh, how much do light emissions vary depending on the area of the greenhouse, right? Uh, is there a difference between the, the walkway in the greenhouse versus an area of the greenhouse that has more vegetation? So I'll, I'll show you some of the data uh, from those studies. Uh, and from for these, especially the drone studies uh, and, and, and the, um, uh, the emission studies that I'll be talking about, we collaborated with a number of commercial greenhouses. Uh, very thankful to, for the operators to uh, allowing us to, to uh, to study the uh, light coming from their greenhouses by flying the drones uh, over them. And you can see a lot of these greenhouses grew uh, you know, many different uh, crops. The, uh, some uh, grew tomatoes, cucumbers, and, and peppers, while others were flower greenhouses, and, and some uh, were growing uh, cannabis. Uh, we also included some propagation greenhouses to, in order to really survey different types of production systems. The lighting uh, that was used in these commercial greenhouses varied. Uh, some had high pressure sodium lights, uh, HPS, some had 
uh, light emitting diodes that would be LEDs. Uh, some had a combination uh, of the two, of LEDs and HPS, like a hybrid system. Uh, and this particular cannabis greenhouse had the metal halide uh, lights. Uh, the covering also varied depending on the greenhouse. Some were uh, glass uh, greenhouses, uh, some were uh, plastic. Um, uh, many of them you can see here had a light abatement curtains. So these were kind of the early days uh, uh, before some of the bylaws came into effect uh, where some of them had the, the light abatement curtains. Uh, other uh, greenhouses had uh, blackout curtains. Uh, and some had no uh, light control, light restricting curtains at all. They just had uh, energy curtains. So we wanted to include those in there as well, you know, as, as a good comparison. We also kept track of uh, how much cloud cover there was, whether it was, you know, a clear night, an overcast night, just to make sure we take those into consideration uh, when we're uh, reporting the results, as well as the moon uh, elevation, as well as the face. So, you know, how high was it in the sky? Was it a full moon or, or a new moon? Those sorts of that sort of information was uh, collected as well, uh, just to make sure that we have that data. So the main way that the light was measured using this uh, drone here. Uh, so uh, there were a couple of uh, sensors that were attached to the drone. Uh, there was a low light sensor, or what uh, what is called the sky quality meter, so SQM, uh, and we also attached just a regular uh, camera. We tried to compare those two sensors to see what the difference was. Uh, the flights were conducted over the greenhouses either in the early morning, so between uh, 3 a.m. Uh, to 6 a.m., uh, or uh, at night, uh, early, uh, you know, uh, early evening uh, between uh, 8 p.m. Uh, and midnight, depending on the greenhouse and the operators and, and uh, some of the, you know, uh, weather uh, permitting conditions, right? Uh, the, the camera settings remain fairly constant throughout all flights, except for the exposure time that was changed. Um, and that's the way that uh, that those particular flights were done. The SQM uh, meters or the sky quality meters were also used to measure sky brightness. Uh, and there were three main locations that were used for the SQM. So uh, we did uh, set the SQMs beside the greenhouse uh, on top of vehicle, vehicles shielded from the outside uh, light sources in order to capture that sky glow right beside the, the greenhouse. But then we also put some SQM sensors in a rural dark sky area uh, to get kind of a control where uh, very little uh, light pollution uh, was, uh, as well as uh, compared it to uh, a more urban, uh, like a nearby town, uh, just to kind of try to compare some of these regions and uh, and and how the the light uh, looks in uh, in these different regions. And, and when possible, um, as I mentioned, the SQM was put in a, a nearby town. So here's some of the data that we got when we flew uh, the drones right on top of the greenhouses. Uh, and you can see here on the, on the x-axis, uh, this is the observed light intensity. Uh, sorry, on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have the distance from the leading edge. So as the drone started flying from the edge of the greenhouse and, and flew over it, this is kind of what this represents. Uh, you can see there's a, a lot of variability, right, in terms of how much light is being emitted from these greenhouses, how much light is coming out of the greenhouse is dependent really on the intensity uh, of, of the light fixtures, as you would expect. Uh, and that intensity dependent on the crop that's grown, obviously. So uh, you can see here the, you know, the, the tomato uh, greenhouse and the cannabis greenhouse had some of the highest uh, light uh, emissions uh, because they had some really strong lights. Uh, but thing, uh, other greenhouses like the flower greenhouses or the propagation greenhouses, for example, uh, that didn't necessarily have uh, the strong light intensities that are required by some of the other crops that were included had uh, lower uh, light intensities in terms of the light that was uh, coming out of these greenhouses. We also looked at uh, what the, the light emissions would look like when the uh, light abatement curtains or any kind of curtain that was there was, was deployed, right? Whether, whether it was a 0% gap, so it was 100% closed or, or deployed uh, versus a 10% gap. And, uh, and we looked at the SQM uh, sensor, but also compared it to just the regular camera that was mounted to the uh, drone. And we can see here, these are the greenhouses that have the light abatement curtains. Uh, these greenhouses have the uh, blackout curtains that I mentioned, and these two just have the uh, energy curtains. 
And what we see is a, is a pretty clear trend amongst the light abatement curtains when there's 0% gap, uh, you know, the uh, light, abatement, light abatement curtains do a great job of keeping that light in. We only have, uh, you know, somewhere between uh, five uh, up to less than 1% of light being emitted, depending on, you know, how the light abatement curtains were installed and then make sure there's no um, uh, there's no areas where, you know, uh, the light abatements were, were gapped or anything like that. Uh, so if they're very well installed and, and, and very well uh, deployed and, and there was no gaps there, uh, we had any, you know, so in some cases less than 1% uh, of the light uh, coming out. Uh, and as that uh, gapping increased to 10%, there was a corresponding increase in the amount of light coming out, uh, as we would expect. Uh, again, there was a there was a range, but it seemed to correlate with the amount of uh, gapping. So a ten percent uh, gap usually, uh, you know, uh, allowed a ten percent more light out of the greenhouses as we would expect. The the black curtains did a very similar um, uh, job in terms of the effect on the light emissions. Very little light when they were a hundred percent deployed with the zero percent gap. When that ten percent gap. Uh, happened with the blackout curtains, uh, there was a corresponding increase in the amount of light that was being emitted. Uh, when we looked at the energy curtains, of course, these are not meant to restrict light emissions, and that's exactly what we saw. We saw uh, first huge variability uh, in terms of the amount of light that was coming out, and anywhere between you know 75% down to 33%, depending on the light abatement curtain and how it was used. Um, when there was a gapping, um, you know, this, because these uh, curtains didn't uh, really, um, weren't designed for, you know, keeping the light uh, uh, out, or keeping the light inside the greenhouse, uh, there wasn't really too much of a correlation between gapping and uh, how the energy curtains uh, responded. Okay, so uh, um, next we looked at the uh, effect of the uh, greenhouse curtains on uh, sky glow. So what I showed you earlier were really just the drones kind of flying over the greenhouses, collecting the data for the light that was emitted. Uh, this data here shows you the uh, sky glow effect mm -hmm. where you know the sky quality meter was set on the ground, pointed up at the sky at these different locations uh, to see the effect uh, of the, the greenhouse light on the uh, sky glow. And the way that these graphs work is uh, the, uh, the um, y-axis here, as the numbers go up, the, the darkness increases, okay? So uh, that's why I flipped it. Uh, it's kind of upside down a little bit. Um, so as you go down uh, the uh, y-axis here, uh, you have more darkness. And, and we have the three uh, different lo locations with the rural dark sky, the nearby town, and the on-site, so right beside the greenhouse. And we have the three different scenarios with uh, zero gapping, a 10% gapping, and just 100% uh, open uh, light abatement curtains. Um, and then this is, you know, a, more of a case study between Greenhouse 8 and, and Greenhouse 9. We have data for the other greenhouses as well. Uh, but just like with the uh, drones, it's very difficult to generalize, right? Uh, with this data, it, there's a lot of variability. It's, it seems to be site-specific. So that's just something to keep in mind when we're looking at this uh, data that I'm presenting today. Um, so what, what we see here is with the rural dark sky, uh, it's very dark. That's why you have uh, very uh, uh, high numbers here. Um, and the effect uh, was very little of the greenhouses and in, in these uh, uh, at the site because it was so far away from the greenhouse. Um, and the a nearby town, uh, because there's a lot more light in, in the nearby town, uh, the numbers uh, reflect that. Uh, and again, uh, not much of an effect of the nearby town because it already had so much light uh, uh, by the uh, greenhouse. Um, but then when we're looking at the greenhouse itself, you can see uh, these particular greenhouses uh, were already in areas that hide, that had a significant uh, sky glow, right? They're, they're comparable to the, the nearby town, even with a 0% uh, curtain uh, gapping. So even with the curtains completely closed. Uh, but we see uh, a slight increase when that when those curtains were opened by about 10%. We do see uh, a slight increase in, in the sky glow, but really the significant uh, effect uh, of the greenhouse light on the sky glow really happened uh, when it was a completely open, 100% uh, uh, gapping. And this was uh, seen in both uh, greenhouse 8 as well as uh, greenhouse 9.
Uh, and next, the, the researchers looked at uh, different parts of the greenhouse. Um, so they looked at greenhouse one and greenhouse six and, and looked at the uh, spatial uh, analysis. So uh, really areas that were distinct uh, in, in, in having differences in vegetation, uh, specific, specifically the density of vegetation, you know, whether it was a part of the greenhouse that was a walkway that really didn't have any vegetation at all, Another part of the greenhouse that had less vegetation, maybe it was a propagation greenhouse or there were seedlings in that part, uh, or was it a fully mature crop, especially with the vine crops? Uh, was it a dense, um, or was it an area with very dense uh, vegetation? And those areas were cut out uh, from the overall greenhouse image uh, for mean pixel analysis. Uh, and the researchers looked at the red, uh, green, and uh, blue channels to kind of see you know, is there uh, a difference uh, in the emissions from these different parts of the greenhouse? And uh, as you would uh, expect, um, so first, let me just talk about this graph here. So we have the, the light intensity on the y-axis and then uh, heavily vegetated, somewhat vegetated and no plants at all, like a walkway. And as you would expect, the, you know, the more vegetation, uh, the, the less uh, light was being emitted, right? The, the plants were absorbing uh, the, uh, the light and not uh, emitting, not letting it uh, escape the, the greenhouse as much as areas uh, where just like a concrete floor uh, and no plants were uh, grown there. So this was the case uh, in, in both of these greenhouses, whether it was the red, uh, green, or uh, blue colors that were analyzed. So some of the conclusions from this uh, first part is that the uh, results in the study, as I mentioned, should be viewed just as a case study more than a generalization, it was very difficult to uh, generalize because it seemed like a lot of the data was site specific. Uh, but the researchers also showed that, uh, you know, using the drone provided a practical and feasible way of doing this type of field study. This is really the first time that drones were used uh, in this way uh, to look at greenhouse uh, light emissions. Uh, and greenhouse using supplemental lighting with fully open curtains uh, usually increased sky brightness substantially uh, near the greenhouse uh, as compared to, you know, 10% gap or, or a 0% uh, gap. Uh, the use of greenhouse light abatement curtains and black uh, curtains was an effective way of uh, reducing uh, light emissions and sky brightness, as we would ex uh, expect, uh, and that the crop density uh, had a substantial effect uh, on the greenhouse light emissions, uh, as we saw. So for the, those were the first uh, couple of uh, seasons in, uh, in this uh, project. Uh, when we got to the winter of 2022 and 2023, uh, the researchers wanted to look at some uh, different questions. And, and some of the questions that uh, the researchers tried to address uh, at this particular time was, what is the effect of the fully deployed curtains on the greenhouse environment? So. Uh, you know, we looked up outside the greenhouse for the first couple of seasons. Now we wanted to look inside uh, the greenhouse on the effect of the light abatement curtains on uh, relative humidity, uh, air temperature, and plant temperature. And the, re the researchers uh, compared different lighting systems, uh, HPS versus uh, LED lights, but also different lighting recipes. If you're using a conventional 16-hour lighting recipe or, uh, you know, the, the newer uh, um, uh, longer um, uh, photo periods with like a 24 hour low intensity lighting uh, recipe and, and how those lighting recipes affected the uh, the greenhouse environment. Uh, also, the research looked at uh, how uh, does lighting uh, before sunrise and or versus after sunset affect uh, the, the length of time the light abatement curtains are uh, used, right? So uh, more on uh, the timing of, uh, of the lighting and, that, and how that affects um, how long you actually have to use the light abatement curtains and how long you have to worry about managing the uh, greenhouse environment uh, under those curtains. Um, so at the University of Guelph, there was some modeling done. Uh, first, to look at how fully deployed light abatement curtains uh, resulted uh, in uh, different air temperatures uh, and humidities below and above the crop. So, uh, they uh, modeled a, a greenhouse that had uh, light abatement curtains that was uh, fully uh, closed. Uh, and because the model calculated, you know, the, 
uh, the, around the uh, transpiration that the plants uh, produce, the, the heat from the uh, greenhouse, as well as the, the light, uh, as well as the uh, effect of the outside environment. All those calculations uh, show that the model um, really uh, anticipating and, and uh, predicting uh, you know, a colder temperature uh, above uh, the curtains than below uh, the curtains, as uh, we would expect. Um, so that's why you really have to take care when you're uh, gapping the curtains to, to do slowly to reduce that uh, cold air shock when uh, the, the cold air drops from the attic into the lower parts of the, the greenhouse. Uh, and they also looked at the venting. You know, some of the newer greenhouses have vents uh, up in the in the roof. Others have uh, vents in the uh, in the sidewall. Um, and and it, uh, the model showed that you know venting, um, uh, depending on the location, um, uh, affected the the green the environment uh, in that compartment only. So that if the vents were in the in the roof you were able to uh, to circulate the air uh, only in the attic and didn't really affect the um, the bottom portion of the greenhouse because of the light abatement curtains uh, were there. Uh, but if you had vents on the side, then you would be able to, to vent uh, the uh, lower portion of the greenhouse without affecting the top uh, if those light abatement curtains were fully deployed. Uh, and in order to, um, uh, to verify uh, some of the modeling uh, results, uh, there was a case study in a commercial greenhouse in southwestern Ontario, uh, and this is uh, where we really verified the, the model, and this is a little bit of a, a busy uh, graph, but we have uh, curtain closure on this y-axis, uh, so we go from 0% uh, uh, closing, so fully open, to 100% closed uh, up here, uh, and on this y-axis we have the temperature, um, and uh, we have two, uh, and on the bottom here, just different days in uh, in December of, of that year. Uh, and you can see here that the two different colors in blue and, and green are two different types of curtains. They had a an energy uh, curtain in the green and a, a light abatement curtain in the blue. And uh, you can see both curtains were used uh, together, which is usually the case in a lot of these commercial uh, greenhouses. You see the the green and the blue uh, curtains of both the light abatement curtain and the energy curtain are usually closed at the same time and down here are open at the same time. And uh, typically you would want to open one first before opening the other and, and do it slowly in a manner so that you reduce that cold shock that I mentioned. But you can see when both curtains were deployed, you have the stratification of air and temperature. Uh, we have the uh, red, which is the lower uh, air temperature. Um, uh, or sorry, that's the uh, yeah, that's the uh, the lower uh, air temperature, and the yellow is the attic air temperature. So that's above the light abatement curtains, and you can see the stratification is very clear when the uh, curtains are fully closed. You have warmer temperatures in the lower part of the greenhouse as opposed to the attic. Once those curtains are opened, um, you have a conversions of the temperatures where you know the the air mixing is is happening between the attic and then the bottom part of the greenhouse. And, uh, and you have uh, conversions of, uh, of temperature there. So that really verified what the model was uh, predicting. In order to understand uh, the effect of light abatement curtains on greenhouses a little bit more, uh, the researchers at Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada's uh, Harrow Research and Development Center uh, outfitted four of their mini greenhouses. So something to keep in mind, these are fairly small, so they're only 50 meters squared, uh, but we uh, they use these greenhouses uh, to outfit um, four of them uh, with light abatement curtains. Uh, so two of them had HPS, these two here, and the other two had LED lights. Uh, we had one HPS with light, ab light abatement curtains. Uh, the other ones with, with no light abatement curtains used. Uh, same with the LEDs. One of them uh, used fully deployed light abatement curtains, uh, whereas the other LED greenhouse uh, did not. So it was, a, it was a great way of getting some data you know, with these different scenarios. The lights were kept on between uh, 2 a.m. Uh, till uh, 6 uh, p.m. And they measured the air temperature as well as the plant temperature and the relative uh, humidity as well. And this is uh, some of the data that the researchers got. We have the temperature on the y-axis uh, and the air temperature when the lights are on and the lights are off uh, and the 24-hour average air temperature. We also have the plant temperature with the lights are on 
and lights are off and the average 24 hour uh, plant temperature. Uh, we have four different treatments, LEDs uh, without the lights, LED, uh, sorry, LEDs without the light abatement curtains uh, deployed, uh, LEDs with the light abatement curtains, 100% deployed, uh, fully closed, uh, HPS lights with um, no light abatement curtains and HPS lights with uh, light abatement curtains deployed. And, and what we're seeing is a, a very similar trend uh, in, in all the uh, data here where we have a an increase in the uh, air temperature, as well as uh, an increase in the in the plant temperature under both LEDs, as well as HPS when the light abatement curtains are closed. And, uh, and as we expected, we're seeing a much bigger increase uh, of the air temperature under HPS than, than we do see under uh, LEDs. The relative humidity uh, was also measured, and you can see there are some uh, uh, changes as, as well. Um, so we have the relative humidity with the lights on, relative humidity with the lights off, and the 24 hour average uh, of the uh, relative humidity under those four different conditions. And what we see with the LEDs is a is a an increase in the relative uh, humidity uh, because we would expect that kind of uh, trapping of uh, the the moisture uh, by the light abatement curtains. Whereas with HPS, we saw the the opposite actually, and and we think what's happening here is that the HPS is heating the the air uh, uh, so much that you're actually seeing a drop in the relative humidity because of the increase in the uh, air temperature due to the HPS uh, radiation. Uh, and then uh, what the uh, researchers did uh, in the uh, winter of uh, 2022 and 2023, so this was just the last uh, uh, winter uh, season, um, not this one, but last year's, um, where they used uh, two mini greenhouses uh, with a, a tomato crop um, under LED lights this time. So they just looked at uh, LEDs uh, with light abatement curtains uh, fully deployed and they wanted to see if the photo period, um, if the real, the lighting recipe kind of affected uh, some of uh, the uh, growing conditions. And they uh, looked at the conventional 16 hour photo period. So lights on between 2 a.m. and 6 p.m. with 250 micromoles per meter squared per second. And then more of a, a 24 hour photo period. So this is a longer photo period with reduced light intensity. Uh, so they had a 2 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, lighting regime of 200 micromoles per meter square per second. And then from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., uh, they dropped that to 100 micromoles per meter square per second. The key is they had the same DLI in both treatments, just a different way of um, uh, giving the plants that, that light. Uh, and they, they measured the air temperature. And, and what we see from uh, this data here is over the, uh, here, the, these are the different days, uh, the 16 hours in the orange and the 24 hour uh, photo period is in blue. Uh, we see huge fluct fluctuations uh, in air temperature uh, in these mini greenhouses because they are fairly small. Um, but what we're seeing is with the uh, 24 hour uh, uh, light recipe, we don't see as much uh, in the fluctuation as we do with the uh, 16 hour. We do see peaks, you know, every now and then, but overall, uh, the conclusion is with a 24-hour uh, long photo period, low intensity uh, lighting uh, that you're able to do with LEDs, uh, you'll see a reduce in, in fluctuation uh, in the air temperature uh, under light abatement currents as compared to a 16-hour standard um, uh, photo period. And finally, the researchers looked at, um, uh, you know, what is the what? How does the timing of the lighting affect? Uh, the the environment under these curtains. Um, so they analyzed uh, sunrise and uh, and sunset uh, data um, to find out if lighting before sunrise or after sunset affected the length uh, that the time uh, that producers have to deploy the light abatement curtains. Uh, lights were on between two a.m. And, and six p.m. That was the definition of you know before sunrise. Uh, and for uh, after sunset, the lights were on. Uh, between uh, 8 a.m. until midnight using a traditional, uh, typical 16-hour uh, photo period. And here's the, the data from that. So it's a, it's a fairly busy um, table. And what we see here is the month and the year in this column, the average uh, sunrise time, uh, average sunset time, 
the length of time, and this is uh, the, the important columns here, this is the length of time the light of incurrence would have to be deployed, um, you know, between uh, sunset and, and sunrise when the when those lights are on. Uh, the average out, outdoor air, uh, and this was important to see if that differential will help growers, you know, um, uh, um, uh, you know, manage the, the greenhouse environment with venting and the average temperature difference between outside and inside the greenhouse. Uh, but really, I just want to kind of focus on those two columns here. And we see, for example, in October, that if your lights were on after sunset, you would have to use the, the curtains for four hours and 40 minutes. Um, very similar if the lights were on before sunrise. But as that day uh, starts to shorten in November, you start seeing some separation here, some differences, where you'll be uh, having to use the light abatement curtains for five hours and 30 minutes if your lights were on after sunset versus if the lights were on uh, before sunrise. And the biggest difference uh, uh, that we expected was in December, where if the lights were on after sunset, you would have to deploy your light abatement curtains for six hours. Whereas if you uh, turn those lights on before sunrise, you only had to use them for four and a half hours, right? So that's the that's the main difference there. And, and, and of course, um, if you have your lights on before sunrise, you have colder temperatures outside, which was uh, thought to be a benefit because then it allowed uh, the growers to vent a lot easier uh, and, and to control and, and to gap and, and to control that temperature a lot easier if um, that temperature outside the greenhouse was much lower than uh, inside the, the greenhouse. So some of the conclusions from uh, those experiments is that you know gapping uh, is a very good way of controlling your, your greenhouse, but please do it when uh, when possible, according to your local bylaws, uh, growers should think about refining their lighting recipes. And as as, as we showed, uh, long photo periods with low uh, lighting um, uh, recipes may be helpful to help uh, you know minimize the fluctuation in air temperature under light abatement curtains. And the timing of lighting is also very important. So lighting before sunrise rather than after sunset might be a benefit because you're not using the light abatement curtains for as long. And the temperatures are outside are, are cooler, so you're able to control uh, the greenhouse uh, environment a little bit better. What I didn't want, didn't really talk about, but something that we're working on uh, for future um, research is looking at through curtain fans. So these are uh, fans that go right through the curtain when the curtains are fully deployed, that are able to uh, mix the air from uh, the attic uh, with the air uh, below the the greenhouse. And that way you're able to vent your greenhouse without actually gapping at all. So that's something that we're uh, looking at. And here are some examples of the available through curtain fans. Uh, and these are just some of the manufacturer specifications, um, you know, uh, different models uh, looking at the ventilation capacity. You can go, you can have models that are uh, 5,200 meters uh, cubed per hour versus 5,500. Uh, some of them are installed in different ways, right? Uh, some of them, are installed on the side of the trusses where you have to have actually put a hole in your screen. Others uh, you can put on the truss itself so you don't have to put a hole in your screen at all. And the way that they um, uh, circulate the air uh, in the greenhouse is also, some of them blow the air horizontally, some of them do it horizontally and vertically. So there are some uh, definite um, uh, differences and that's something we're hoping to um, uh, to look at in, uh, in some of the research that we're doing now. So. This leads me into the, some of the future research. I, I, um, I did mention the through uh, fan, through curtain fan. So we're hoping to uh, do some modeling as well as uh, get some verification um, with some case studies of, about how these through curtain fans uh, work and, and how well they work uh, to, to get some public data available for, uh, for the industry. Uh, but also looking at the effect of gapping. Uh, you know, a lot of the, um, um, data that I showed you was, you know, with the curtains fully deployed and their effect on the greenhouse uh, environment and plant health. But we're really hoping uh, to also get some data about, you know, how does the gapping uh, influence the greenhouse environment and plant health and, and release that data in uh, the, the coming uh, months. So I'd like to end by uh, acknowledging the many commercial greenhouses, uh, the owners, the staff and businesses and, and individual property owners that permitted the growers and supported the uh, the the researchers. I, I should say permitted the researchers and supported 
the researchers in, in their efforts to do data collection, both with the drone as well as the SQM meter, as well as with providing data uh, from their computers, as, uh, as I showed you. Uh, this study is part of a larger research project uh, funded by uh, OMAFRA uh, as in collaboration with uh, Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers uh, and the uh, University of Guelph and AFC, as I mentioned. So I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to me today. Best way to get a hold of me is uh, by email. Uh, feel free to scan this QR code. It'll, it'll give you my contact info uh, right in your phone and you can uh, save it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll open it up to uh, any uh, questions. Thank you, Fatty, for this very enlightening presentation. Um, so we will move on to questions right away and we have some in here. Um, so Fadi, do you want me to just jump in with, uh, with the Q and A's here? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay. So here's a, here's a really interesting question. Um, how much light is reflected from the inside of the light abatement curtains to the crop, uh, to the can uh, canopy? Have growers dimmed their lighting to respond to additional inter-reflected light and maintained a consistent PPFD slash uh, daily light integral? Uh, this could also reduce light emissions. So Right. So very good question. Uh, and, and the question is uh, really depending on um, the, the crop that you're growing, the stage of the crop. And, uh, and 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 what kind of lights you're using, right? Because so as I showed, um, you know, the greenhouse that has a young crop uh, that doesn't have a lot of vegetation is reflecting a lot more light, right? So you would expect the light of Bayman curtains to be reflecting a lot more light back into the greenhouse in that scenario versus uh, a much more uh, grown crop. If, if you have a much fuller crop in your greenhouse, uh, the crop is uh, absorbing that light not reflecting as much as I showed, and we would expect that not not as much light is being reflected back into the crop. So that's a very good question because as you can imagine, it's very dynamic as, as the kind of crop uh, grows, especially with the vine crops, um, as it gets bigger and, and, and bigger throughout the winter uh, term, you would have less and less light being reflected. Uh, so this all depends on, you know, the kind of technology that the greenhouse is employing, right? If you have the right light sensors, place in the right spot to actually measure exactly how much light the plants are getting, whether it's lights from the uh, uh, supplemental lighting or from reflection from the light abatement curtains. Um, and, and the ability to dim that light in response to the reflection from the light abatement curtains, right? That all depends on the technology that you have. Do you have uh, LEDs, right, that are able to be, to dim? Do you have the, the technology, the sensors that are able to talk to the lights and, and dim them uh, correspondingly in order to achieve that uh, DOI that you're looking for. So very good question. I think uh, it, it's definitely something that uh, growers should be uh, thinking about because you can't really do that with HPS, right? It, it's very difficult to kind of dim HPS. You can potentially turn off some HPS lights. Maybe that's kind of one way to do it, but it's very difficult. Um, it's it's not as flexible, right, as, as the LEDs, right? So uh, very, very good question and very good point. Okay, uh, and then next question. Is the light transmission of light abatement spectrally neutral? Do you have SPD measurements of the light emitted from the curtains, uh, glass, plastic, plus material, and gaps, glass curtain only? Does that make sense, Fatty? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, so I think the uh, the question is is talking about the spectral um, profile of of the light that's being emitted, right? Um, so we looked a little bit with the blue, green, and and red. Um, unfortunately, the and we were hoping to answer that question um, to be truthful. Uh, unfortunately, we don't necessarily have the proper data set to answer that question, right? We were definitely hoping to answer you know, what is the spectral output of the greenhouses? And I think 
as you might imagine, and as you as people who live in the area know, it depends on the greenhouse, right? You have the the yellow haze coming from the HPS lights. You have the pink haze coming from more of the LED, especially if if you're using uh, red and blue. Um, uh, you have more of a a white haze if it's a uh, if it's a bright uh, or a, what are they called like a hot white, uh, you know, more blue kind of uh, light. So. Um, yeah, those those questions were something that we were thinking about, and the researchers were hoping to answer that, uh, but unfortunately, we just don't have the the data set to uh, give you a hundred percent. Is that something that maybe might come up, like with the future research you were referencing? Yeah, absolutely. If uh, I think we would have to work on uh, the sensors that we're using, so the SQM uh, sensor and the and the uh, photo sensor that we had. Uh, didn't give us the capability of doing that. But I think if we are able to integrate some of the more advanced sensors that are out there right now, some stuff that I'm using inside the greenhouse, uh, then we could potentially uh, answer that question for sure. Okay. Uh, we still have a few more questions here. Uh, okay. Have growers or research researchers seen any bird collisions or bird attraction slash disorientation behavior with illuminated greenhouses? Yeah, I am uh, not the right person to um, to answer that question. Um, we studied only the the, the greenhouses and then the light from the greenhouses. Um, I'd say maybe you know. Um, some environmental uh, groups may may have that answer, but I don't have uh, any kind of data on that at all. Okay. Um, let's see, what do we got here? Uh, which type of curtain is most effective for blocking light between two glass compartments? Yeah, so um, at we do have curtains that are being used uh, in the research greenhouses to do exactly that. So we use uh, the light abatement curtains to try to separate some uh, lighting trials, right? Where one side is getting a certain light recipe and the other side is getting a different light recipe. And that's what it sounds like this grower wants to do, right? Is to kind of separate uh, different uh, glass ranges. Um, so definitely talk to your uh, curtain consultant. Uh, something that you wanna keep in mind is uh, make sure you have the white side uh, of the curtains pointing towards the, the greenhouse in order to reflect that light back in. But uh, a typical, um, um, you know, ceiling uh, curtain would do, would, like the light, uh, uh, light abatement curtains, the, not the not the heavy ones, right, in terms of the, the weight, uh, would do just fine. Um, we're using, and I don't want to, you know, say the model or the supplier that we're using, just so I'm, I don't look like I'm endorsing anybody, but um, they're fairly typical light abatement curtains that are that are used. So um, uh, yeah, so just talk to your uh, curtain supplier, and I'm sure they have some great recommendations. But just make sure that the that those uh, the white side is uh, pointing towards your plants. That's really the the only thing to really think about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's here's an interesting one. Do you know the moisture transfer capabilities of the different screens used? This is difficult data to find from suppliers, which would be interesting to have. Absolutely. So uh, we actually, part of this big project, um, one of Professor Thomas Graham's uh, students, um, if I remember correctly, actually is um, or did do exactly that. So uh, she looked at the moisture uh, transfer capabilities of some of these curtains. I think she got some uh, samples. Uh, I don't have the data yet. I think we're the researchers are still analyzing that, uh, but definitely something that uh, the researchers are uh, thinking about. And, and hopefully, um, you know, the next um, iteration of, of the fact sheet or best management practice document that we publish will have that data in it. Um. <clears throat> Beside the problems associated with temperature and RH control, uh, light abatement curtains is certainly, in my opinion, as, as the growers benefit from light abatement curtains, as they lose less light, as more lights are sent back to the greenhouse space. Does it make sense? Hmm. Uh, 
<clears throat> so the we're talking about the benefit um, as they lose less light. Right. So I think this is exactly what we talked about with the uh, one of the earlier questions, right? Talking about the reflection of light coming back in and, and you're not uh, some of the benefits, right? We talked a lot about the effects on the greenhouse environments and and, and the temperature and relative humidity and those sorts of things that, that might be a struggle for greenhouses. Uh, absolutely right. With a lot of these comments are talking about the benefits of uh, of the light abatement curtains, which I don't think I highlighted very well, uh, besides the energy savings. Uh, so there are energy saving considerations, as I mentioned, 50% uh, up uh, in, in some cases that you could save on uh, heating costs, especially. Uh, but also uh, exactly that is if you're reflecting that light, keeping that light inside your greenhouse, you may not have to light as much. So you're saving both heating costs as well as uh, potentially uh, electricity costs. Hmm. Good point. Um, and maybe just one or two more. What do you think, Fadi? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, what is the range of gapping and time interval needed to minimize relative humidity while still mitigating light pollution? Yeah. So the um, uh, the in, in terms of the the gapping. Uh, so what what I do know from uh, talking to growers and uh, sorry, there's a lot of things popping up here. Um, I'm not sure how to mute this, but anyway. So. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, from what I know to our growers, as well as some, you know, the stuff that we've been doing in the past few years is really, you don't need more than a 10% gap. It, it sounds like a 10% uh, gap is more than enough in terms of uh, what growers need to uh, control the greenhouse. Uh, but that gapping is necessary, right? Gapping is something that uh, that the growers uh, need to do if, if they don't have the through curtain uh, fans in order to control that that greenhouse and and the question is you know how um what what's the time how, how long do you need to to gap it for right and and again that depends on uh the lights that you're using so if you're using hps lights obviously you'd need to gap longer uh in order to uh, to mitigate some of the heating and, and relative humidity issues uh as opposed to an led light right um as well as the 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 growing stage of the uh, plant, right? If uh, same with the light emissions, if you know, if you can imagine the, the younger uh, crop is not tr transpiring as much, uh, you don't have as much uh, humidity being built up, that kind of thing. Whereas the more uh, fuller uh, crop later on in the season uh, has uh, much more uh, transpiration coming. So depending on the time of year, I think, uh, and depending on how cold it is outside, how how easy easy it is for you to uh, to to cool down that greenhouse. That's why we talked about uh, changing the timing uh, of the uh, of the temperature. Uh, sorry, the timing of uh, of the lighting. Sorry, this is uh, I should have turned off my Teams thing. Um, now a lot of things are popping up. So um, depending on the timing of the lighting. So we talked about you know if you could start your lights in the early morning before sunrise, rather than uh, keep them going till after sunset, that might help uh, reduce the amount of time that not only you're using the light abatement curtains, but you need to gap because it's colder outside, you can vent, it, it's a lot easier to cool down that greenhouse, faster to cool down that greenhouse, so you might need as much. So a lot of different factors really play into uh, some of those uh, questions. Yeah. Um... And finally, how do you determine the efficiency of light spectrum abatement slash addition in the daylight hours in the CA in the controlled environment agriculture versus a outdoor ag? Yeah, and and this is uh, uh this I could do a whole lecture on this topic <laughs> by itself because it's such a such a big question. The, the question really comes down to you know uh, using supplemental lighting during the day and i and we didn't really talk about that today but i do want to touch on it a little bit just to, to say that um you know the, the the trend is that lighting um the lighting season is typically you know november december until the end of march that kind of thing right where growers are using new overhead lights to increase the dli but that's not the only uh, way that growers are using the, there are a lot of uh, interlighting technologies out there right now 
uh, you know, uh, with the uh, intercanopy lighting, intracanopy lighting, I should say, uh, that are that can be used year round, and they are being used year round in order to uh, light different production systems. If you have a low wire cucumber uh, production, you could potentially use interlighting, uh, you know, to reduce the shading effect of the umbrella system, right? Uh, or even even the high wire crops. There's a lot of shading that happens uh, in those systems as uh, as well. So if you want to reduce that shading. Uh, you could use the interlighting year round and and uh, it's happening not obviously at, at the same level as the overhead lighting but i do know it's happening and that means that the growers are doing the benefit cost analysis right mm -hmm. that ROI, which is very important to them and to me the fact that the growers are, are using it means uh, that there are cases where using interlighting uh, year round is something that uh, growers should think about uh, and should trial to see if it works for them you know, nothing is going to beat free sunlight, right? It's free sunlight for with outdoors, with greenhouses. Uh, you're not going to be able to, uh, to to beat it in terms of, you know, paying for it uh, with electricity costs. But really, the supplemental lighting is there to enhance uh, the Mother Nature's uh, tools, right? To enhance the uh, sunlight that we're getting uh, in the shoulder seasons, as well as the summertime. Sometimes, uh, you know, we have those uh, dark days or... or uh, even shading effects that happens in the in the greenhouse. Um, so uh, at the end of the, at the end of the day, you know the grower has to do what's right for their production system, what's right for their uh, marketing, uh, what's right for their lifestyle. You know, some growers say to me, "I love getting my December's off, so I I don't necessarily want to grow with lights. I don't I don't want to grow with the uh, in the winter season, which is fair, right? If uh, if that's what you uh, are looking for, so." A lot of a lot of considerations in terms of which lighting uh, system do I use, uh, when do I use it, and then how I use it. Yeah. Um, okay, and one really last quick one or quick one. Uh, what do you think of also having a dehumidification system? Yeah. So uh, a lot of the um, higher value crops, uh, like the uh, cannabis, for example. Um, have some really sophisticated HVAC systems, right? I, I know of a greenhouse, uh, a cannabis greenhouse in Ontario. It's a fully closed greenhouse. They don't vent at all. They control everything that comes in and out of that, that greenhouse. It's a cannabis greenhouse, very high value crop. So they're able to afford the higher end sophisticated HVAC systems, right? Um, not really an option for um, vegetable producers, for flower uh, growers. I do know that Flowers Canada uh, 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 growers, the the, the association uh, in collaboration with the, the Vineland and, and Omafra did a study looking at dehumidification. Uh, and, and it seemed like some of those systems do help uh, absolutely with reducing uh, the, the humidity. Uh, but again, it's, it's looking at the uh, ROI. Does it make sense for, uh, for my uh, greenhouse? Is it uh, cheaper for me just to put in a, a through curtain fan uh, in order to ventilate better than it is to put in a dehumidification system. Uh, so there are some alternatives out there. And that's a good point uh, is, is the uh, ability to use some of those dehumidification systems is an alternative as well. Yeah. Okay, well, um, it looks like we've reached the end of our session today. So I just, Fatty, I want to thank you so much uh, for for this great presentation. Uh, thank you to all of you who took the time out of your busy schedule to join us today for this webinar. Um, and if you tuned in late to today's session, uh, great news, it's been recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you within 24 hours. Uh, I hope you all are taking home some great information from this webinar. And uh, once again, I'm your host, Amy Kuniakis, the editor for Greenhouse Canada. And I wish you a safe and productive rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good day.